you think interval training on its own is sufficient or do, should you have some zone two in there as well, perhaps like 45 minutes of like zone two? Yeah. And uh, again, um, we, we could talk for hours on, on zone <laughs> two and, and, you know, in some ways I like zone two has been a corrupted term, if you will, or, or, or mm. what I mean by that is classically athletes will talk about three zone training, uh, moderate, heavy, and severe. And so for, for a lot of athletes, zone two, two used to be this, this severe uh, training zone, which is not at all what zone two training is now, which, right. in, you know, in uh, how it's been popularized, right, which is generally relatively low intensity effort below, mm -hmm. certainly below your lactate threshold. Um, so, again, I think it comes back to two things. What are your goals, or maybe mm -hmm. even three things, but you know, what are your goals? What do you like and enjoy? And probably importantly is how much time do you have available or how much time are you willing to invest? I mm -hmm. think all things being equal, a varied approach is, is, is best. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at serious, um, high level elite endurance athletes, they who are engaging in 25, 30 hours a week of structured, serious training, there's good evidence that an 80-20 split is about the best to optimize performance gains. So about 80% lower intensity continuous work and 20% high intensity uh, interval work. That's fairly well um, established. Now, I, I think the, many of the proponents of the zone two approach will say, well, since athletes do that, that's what everyone else should do as well. And so they'll say, mm -hmm. Well, even if you're engaging in an hour a week or a couple hours a week, you should always do 80-20. I don't subscribe to that. There's nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's anything magical or that that's the best way to necessarily train. And I think, you know, I would submit that as total amount of exercise or total training dose gets smaller, you can slide up the intensity a little bit more and you're going to reap more benefits. That's not saying that's how everyone should do it. It's the ideal approach. So I think to answer your question vary it up engaging in some continuous moderate exercise uh is good and and pushing hard huffing and puffing sometimes is uh is good as well now if you're someone who's very time limited you don't want to bother with hours of continuous exercise and you only want to do short vigorous intervals i don't think there's anything wrong with that and i think it can be a very efficient way to maintain your fitness over time great thank you so nutrition Think about nutrition. So how important is nutrition and particular, particularly protein? Uh, how much protein is required, would be required, I guess, well, is op optimal? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so just around my, the corner from where we're doing this interview right now is my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Stuart Phillips, who's obviously mm -hmm. uh, a world uh, leader, a uh, world authority <laughs> on, on, on this topic. You know, clearly, you know, nutrition writ large is is very important for everything mm -hmm. that we're talking about here. You know, can how much can nutrition potentiate fitness gains related to exercise? I think that's a more intriguing question, and it's mm -hmm. probably quite subtle, right? And and so the the potential for whether it's manipulating protein or carbohydrate how that can interact with exercise to, to potentiate uh, gains in certain health-related markers. Um, I think it can, but I think they're subtle. I think it's nuanced. It's very, it might even be very individualized. In terms of protein, I think there's good evidence that active individuals do need higher proteins than what's typically recommended, but it's also not these massive amounts uh, either. And so, you know, uh, 1.5 grams per kilogram per day is probably sufficient for most uh, most individuals. There is interesting research around the timing of protein. And so that, again, can have some subtle influences and in spreading protein through the day. You know, typically how many people uh, consume protein is very little at breakfast, some more at lunch, and then a large protein meal at dinner I think there's good evidence for spreading that out through the day and I, ideally getting bolus doses, equal bolus doses throughout the day, uh, maybe better uh, over the long term. So, you know, there's there's not simple takeaways here in terms of athletes doing this hit needs this much protein to, to benefit. 
Uh, suffice to say, nutrition can be important. Active individuals need a little bit more protein and probably spreading that protein through the day, uh, I would submit are, are some of the big picture messages that people should maybe keep in mind. If I'm going to do a HIIT session, am I going to be mostly, but I, I assume I'm mostly going to be burning carbs. Uh, is it worth taking like a carb hit before that? Like, or, or will I have sufficient glycogen and it's just going to use that? Yeah. For most types of interval exercise, you know, where we're talking 20 up to 30 minutes or so, I, I, I don't think it matters. And certainly you don't right. need to supplement with carbohydrate during, you know, if you're an athlete who's doing five minute efforts at 85% of maximum power for 10, 12 repeats, then, you know, they're going to churn through a lot of glycogen and, and mm -hmm. you could make, make the case that maybe have some carbohydrate on board in that situation is, is, is important. But I think for the vast majority of individuals, it doesn't matter. Uh, and you're right. Uh, the vast majority of energy during the interval sessions themselves is coming from carbohydrate, but it rapidly switches in recovery. So that can be recovery between the bouts and even recovery following exercise where there's greater energy being derived from from fat or lipid and so people will say well you know how can intervals result in fat burning at all or many calories and you know personal trainers talk about the afterburn effect or this idea of a heightened rate of calorie burning and recovery uh it's subtle but it's it's real and it can sort of add up uh over uh over time so uh interval sessions can be uh, a significant source of of energy expenditure or calorie burning if i would we have like a typical 50 year old he's done he or she, actually, so one question would be whether it's different between men and women or male and female. Um, so th they have some fitness. How would they, but they they want to improve. Their, they've read that VO2 max helps. They want to do uh, something to improve their VO2 max and their metabolic health. So how would they think about getting started and measuring it? I mean, would picking the... Um, the the style of interval training really just be a matter of what they think it what they prefer or is there anything else and how many should they do during the week yeah so so loaded question you know <laughs> lo, lo, loads of nuance here as you sorry <laughs> i got the sense but i'll, I'll still give you uh, uh, a potential uh, uh prescription and right. so i i think you know number one uh, and this is just good general advice. If you're going to start or change your fitness regime, ideally check with your physician, uh, especially if you're, you know, 50 years uh, old uh, or so. Uh, number two, I think try to get some marker, as you mentioned, of your cardiovascular and your metabolic health. And so metabolic health can be with a blood panel. You know, what are your glucose levels? What are your mm -hmm. insulin levels? What is your HbA1c? Uh, what are your blood fats? Uh, and also some measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. So whether that's at least the online calculator, whether you do one of these submaximal exercise uh, tests, whether you're using a, a fitness uh, device, try to get some sort of marker in the sand so you know what the starting point is. Uh, then maybe, you know, it, and is this 50 year hypothetical 50 year old, are they starting completely from scratch or are they someone who have, you know, they're used to a little bit of habitual physical activity, maybe at least walking around the block a bit with their, their partners, you know, they engage in maybe a little bit of hiking. Um, so as you know, if they're already have some semblance of physical activity, trying out some of these different interval training strategies that we've talked about, you know, and we'll just, uh, when people are starting out, we'll say, just get out of your comfort zone. So don't start right. with a Tabata. Don't start with a sprint your child from, you know, sprint like you're saving your child from an oncoming car. Get out of your yeah. comfort zone. So whatever you're doing right now, push a little harder, you know, for a few light posts or for a minute or two. So your heart rate feels more elevated. You're a little bit more out of breath. You're huffing and puffing a little bit more than usual. Uh, and then try a few different interval training styles, right? Maybe try a 10 by one. Uh, a three by 20, you know, that's a little higher intervals, maybe a four by four, you know, so start to play around with intensities and durations and see if one or the other appeals to you a, a little bit more. Because again, I'm going to come back to what you like and enjoy, you're more likely to stick with over the long term. So, you know, I can get on a mm. soap soapbox and scream about intervals don't blue in the face and if people really don't like them they're not going to do them and that's that's fine you know then right. i say well yeah. just make sure you're doing something uh so I, I i think that would be the general prescription to start and in terms of duration 
again, how much time do you have available? How much time do you want to commit to this? Ideally, meet the physical activity guidelines for your region. But if you don't want to do that, then, you know, how much time do you have? And I, I would submit that, you know, at least uh, an hour a week of physical activity, uh, you know, whether that's three 20 minute sessions, something like that, at the very least, three 10 minute sessions uh, is, uh, is, is needed uh, to start to move the dial a little bit. Um, you know, you asked about biological sex differences or, or gender differences. We have some done some studies looking at biological sex. I, I think, you know, we, we can't make a blanket statement that uh, females respond this way and males respond this way. There is some evidence to show, for example, that maybe there might be some blunted responses to certain interval training styles in females. But I, I think the inter-individual differences, so just differences between humans are so much greater than differences between males and females uh, per se. Absolutely. Uh, males and females can respond to interval exercise and respond to exercise generally. Um, and the the differences that we might see are much more because of uh, individual differences in how people respond to exercise. So inherent genetic biological variation rather than a sex-based difference per se. So if we're doing resistance exercises, it, you generally don't want to do it like continuously, like every day, because you need a recovery period. Right. And, and generally it's like 48 hours or something like that. Uh, do you have something similar for it? I mean, if, so you say three times a week. So if we do it like once every two days, that sounds about right. Uh, so, again, uh, you know, coming back, let, let's say you're that individual who's like, look, I have three days a week. I got 20 minutes a session. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not worried about them doing resistance exercise every day or, or aerobic exercise or intervals every day. So for that individual, you know, might say, OK, like do one interval session a week, do some sort of resistance exercise once a week. And, you know, maybe mm -hmm. the other keep it a, a 20 minute continuous walk at, or 20 minute continuous mm -hmm. run at the highest pace you can sustain. That might be a reasonable uh, prescription uh, for them. Uh, you know, I, I but otherwise, mm -hmm. if, if you're someone exercising much more than that or every day, yeah, I think uh, switching back and forth between styles uh, can provide a lot of benefit. You know, so resistance exercise one day, aerobic style training the next. But, you know, you probably don't want to be doing heavy squats and leg lifting and then cycling the next day. So even within mm -hmm. that, there's there's some nuance there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I think getting at least two resistance, whole body resistance training sessions in a week uh, and getting three or four aerobic sessions in uh, a week, that's, uh, you know, that's a reasonable strategy. And if you're doing that, probably you're going to reach the public health guidelines in, in most areas, which generally call for two resistance training sessions a week and 150 minutes a week of, of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Would you be able to share your personal regimen? What, what is it that you do in terms of but both in terms of diet, if you're willing to share and also exercise? Yeah. So again, it's just an example. I find it works for me. It's not to say mm -hmm. this is what everyone should uh, should be doing, but uh, my, my, so in terms of my own fitness regime, it depends on the season. Uh, so, you know, we're coming to the end of summer. We just came to the end of summer here in Canada. Uh, I, I, I like to ride my bike. Right. And, and so I, I do, uh, in the summer, the, the, the spring, early fall, I cycle outside a lot. And so I'm doing, you know, four or five, six hours a week of, of cycling. Almost all of it is intermittent style in nature because, you know, where I live is quite hilly in that. So I, I like to ride outside is, is, is the response mm. there. As we move into late fall, winter, uh, early spring, my cycling moves indoors. And so the total amount of time that I spend doing cardio shrinks. Uh, and I very mm. much am someone who does 20 to 30 minutes, four times a week or so on a stationary bike in, in my basement. Uh, and I find, mm. and so all of that is interval based because I find it quite uh, efficient. Uh, and I like to play ice hockey. So I, I, I have a weekly ice hockey game with some friends. And so that would be my general cardio style approach to exercise. And that's also because I'm, I'm a classic individual who has left knee osteoarthritis. So I, I can't run anymore. I gave up running about 15 years ago because uh, I'm trying to put off that knee replacement as long as I can. Uh, and so that's, you know, one of the reasons why I, I moved to, uh, to biking primarily for my cardio. 
And then also I, I do a lot of body weight style interval exercise. I have a classic garage or home gym. I also have a, a, a power, you know, a, a power rack and, and some kettlebells and simple uh, weights. So I do a, a lot of body weight style, you know, functional style resistance training uh, mm. for my resistance exercise. So, you know, typically I'm exercising at least seven, six days a week, sometimes seven. Um, and that's my general approach there. My, my dietary strategy is pretty basic, right? I, I, I try to eat well, which basically <laughs> means follow Canada's food guide, which, uh, again, it's a pretty boring message, but, you know, <laughs> try to minimize red meat, uh, try to minimize, uh, refined processed white carbohydrates, uh, try to have, uh, lots of fruits and vegetables. Uh, and you know, that's my general approach. I, I like to cook. Uh, and so, you know, that, uh, that, that helps as, as, uh, as well, but, you know, balancing all of that with, uh, trying to enjoy life a bit as well. Right. And so, uh, yeah. you know, 80% of the time you try to do the right thing and, you know, 20% you fall off the wagon a little bit and that's okay. I think it's consistency is key over the long term. Right. And so just very briefly, you, you talked a little bit about what you were working on, which was these, uh, so I guess two things, I, I mean, the larger studies, uh, larger studies, and also on uh, snacking. Is is there anything else that you're kind of looking at at the moment, or could you talk about those in a bit more detail? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I, I I've been doing this a while. You know, I, uh, next year will be my 25th year as a faculty member at McMaster University, and a lot of that time has been spent focused on interval training research. Uh, you know, I think if there's a through line, we've had this continuing interest in brief, vigorous, intermittent exercise as a path to health and fitness. Mm. A lot of our early studies were small proof of concept. And so what we're trying, and I still have an interest in basic biological mechanisms. And so we continue to do uh, invasive human research, which involves biopsies and, and you know, looking at the molecular regulation of how the body responds to exercise, uh, you know, so looking at, at genes and molecular transducers and, and things like that. So a very mechanistic based approach, there's always a portion of that. But increasingly, we want to do these larger scale studies, because it's absolutely a limitation of some of our previous work. And, you know, there's there's some critics out there, of course, but the general mm -hmm. criticism that Many hit studies are relatively small, relatively short term. Generally speaking, is fair. There are some larger studies like Generation 100 that was, you know, a five year intervention with 1,500 individuals. But we're trying to do proper randomized controlled trials, thinking about things like statistical power, sample size, effect size, minimizing risk of bias. Uh, and so, you know, as I close out my career, those are the types of studies that I want to do and also collaborating on some even larger studies. You know, I, it's been a privilege to collaborate with an individual in uh, Australia named Emmanuel or Manos uh, Stamatakis, uh, looking at uh, uh, leveraging the UK Biobank. And so we had a study out late last year that was looking at uh, vigorous intermittent lifestyle physical activity in over 25,000 individuals. Uh, and uh, that work showed that three to four minutes a day of vigorous intermittent lifestyle activity, not even structured exercise, uh, was associated with marked reductions in um, all-cause uh, mortality risk from cancer, cardiovascular disease. So again, uh, a variation on this theme, but all converging on this notion that brief, vigorous, intermittent physical activity or exercise can be very, very uh, beneficial. Right. Yeah, that's great. And it's like you, you've you kind of alluded to before. It's like people are, are very different, like the way they react. So it, it you need a large study to be able to get the get the effect size and the power to be able to really show, OK, you know, it, it works for most people. Absolutely. Really. Right. And, you know, an injury question that I get is, well, why isn't hit in the public health guidelines? And I think the, the honest answer is because, you know, there's, there's just not the robust body of evidence that, that people would want to see uh, to show that, mm -hmm. you know, if you gauge in this much structured interval training, uh, you know, mortality rates are lower by this much or cardiovascular disease rates are, are lower by this much. Uh, and the other way to think about it is, well, 
it can completely fit within the public health guidelines. You know, it's mm. it's just a, a variation on on vigorous exercise, only that it's done in a in an intermittent uh, type type manner. So, yeah. Okay, so where can people follow what you're doing? And uh, so you have the you have the book, the the one minute exercise. Yeah, the one minute workout. The one minute uh, workout. My, that's it. Yeah, yeah, written with a, a, a friend and colleague, uh, uh, Chris uh, Chris Shogun. You know, uh, I do have a website, martingabala.com, mm -hmm. which I set up really is just as a one stop shop where people can go and learn about our research. Uh, they can have links to the book. Uh, my colleague Stu Phillips and I offer uh, an online course through the Coursera online learning platform. Mm -hmm. All of that content can be accessed for free. Uh, if someone wants a credential, there's a small fee associated with that, but all the content can be accessed for free. Uh, you can get links to other podcast interviews, uh, some of the media that uh, that we've done uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, my social media presence is uh, limited, but I, I am on Twitter or X uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. and, and so people could uh, tweet me uh, at Gabala M, G-I-B-A-L-A-M, uh, or martingabala.com if they wanted to find out a little bit more. Excellent. Dr. Gabala, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Richard, for this opportunity. Thanks.